So, I'm a ecological economist working primarily in Sciences Po, uh, not far from here, uh, and also teaching in uh, Pont Paris Tech and um, in Stanford University, both in Paris and uh, on, the, on the Stanford campus when there are planes and visas, uh, which is apparently the case um, as we speak, um, because the Biden administration has authorized the Europeans to go back to the US. It's been 20 months that we are prevented from being in the US. Well, Americans have the right to be in Europe, so it was a bit strange, but apparently this has been a change. So I'm working on two fields, which this presentation is going to touch upon. The first field is how to connect environmental issues with social issues. My hypothesis is that uh, environmental issues or ecological issues such as climate change are really social problems that should be addressed as social problems and health is a good mediation to understand why climate change is not you know, a distant crisis on a distant planet. It's very much part of our lives and it's going to be part more and more of our lives, uh, unfortunately. And the other agenda is really to try to build some new ways to think about the economy rather than just growth, profit, income, which is very much the way that the economy is being understood today. You know? So I'm a macroeconomist. My PhD was in macroeconomics. So I know about you know, growth, monetary policy, income, profit, and all those things. But I found out 15 years ago that those things were actually, let's say, not minimal, but at least they were embedded in a greater reality, which is the biosphere. And understanding economics today is the first thing about economics to really understand is that economics is embedded in the biosphere. So when people say that there is a discipline which is economics of the environment or environmental economics, which is a subfield of economics, this is not the reality. The reality is that the whole econo economy and all economics is embedded in the biosphere. So there is actually no economics without the environment. So every economist should be an environmental economist. And this is going to be the case more and more in the 21st century. So this presentation is going to be about how to imagine a new way to think about the economy and economics in the 21st century that is actually compatible with the reality of the 21st century rather than 20, 20th century economics. Uh, and this, those theoretical models which are completely outdated today, okay? So the way I'm going to, and so I will end with what I've arrived at after a long period of thinking, which is that the right way to think about the economy is that health and the connection between health and the environment should be at the center of economic policy. That economic policy in the 21st century should be about health and the environment. And the title Full Health on the Living Planet, which is a reference to something that maybe you know, I'm not sure that you've read it, but at least you've heard of it, which is the Beverage Report. The report that was published, you know, there were two reports published by Law Beverage, okay? One was on full employment, the other one was on social protection. It was back in the 1940s, right, you know, right before the Second World War ended, Law Beverage, who had worked for the previous decades on the question of social protection, social policy, and well-being, published two reports, and one of them was titled Full Employment in a Free Society. Full Employment in a Free Society. That was in 1944. And this came to define the program of economic policy for the decades after the Second World War, at least in the so-called free world, which was the world uh, on the left side of the Berlin Wall, right? So full employment in a free society was basically the program of Western Europe and the US and, and North America, let's say, for the period from 1945 to at least 1975. The question is, is this program still a valid objective to pursue? Or should we need something else? And I think what we need we need a new way to think about what economic policy should be about. And this is what I call full health on a living planet. I will say more when I come to that. So the way I'm going to do this is first, I will tell you, I try to show you that going beyond economic growth, going beyond gross domestic product, 
is a need today. It's not just something that some people might want to pursue. Uh, scientists are telling us very clearly that the pursuit of economic growth is actually a danger. It's dangerous for the biosphere and for our societies and our economies. Then I will talk about the ways that have been tried uh, you know, in the last 150 years to go beyond growth. It's not a new agenda. It has been there for quite some time and there have been several attempts to go beyond growth. And now the pressure is really strong and this field is really growing and so that's of course an irony but the field of beyond growth is in a sense growing, okay? And the question is, so where exactly uh, is the field right now? And I will give you my vision which is that a practical way to go beyond economic growth and make economies compatible with the biosphere in the 21st century is full health on the living planet. I want to start with two recent publications, and by recent I mean in the, in the really last weeks. Okay? The first one is the IPCC report that was published last, last month. Okay? Who here has read at least the summary for policymakers of the IPCC report? Okay, so one takeaway from this uh, lecture is that you should all at least read the summary for policymakers of the IPCC report, which is 40 pages long, so that's not a long read, and that's absolutely crucial for you to understand the world in which you are going to live for the next 50 years. Okay, it might be the most important document that tells you, I mean, the, the future is very uncertain, but we have a number of you know, very precise things in terms of what climate we are going to find. So this is the first publication. The second publication I'm going to start with is a paper that's under review in the Lancet Planetary um, Health Journal. So that's a journal, that's a medical journal that's trying to connect environment issues with medical issues. Lancet Planetary Health, okay? And in this uh, journal, there is a paper that is really much talked about in the last days which is about eco-anxiety. I don't know if you heard about it, but the press you know, made headlines on the fact that among your generation, there is a huge eco-anxiety. That is, you have surveys in which 75% of young people say that they are very afraid of the future. And they are very afraid of the future because they know that ecological crises are coming and that we will not avoid serious problems and very serious ecological shocks. And this eco-anxiety is rational. Okay, you should be afraid. Why? Because of the second publication, which is the IPCC report. And in the IPCC report on page 18, in the summary for policymakers, you have this table. I know this is boring, okay? This might be the most important table, okay, for your future. This table, okay, tells you essentially two things, okay. The first thing that is very clear on this table is that the five climate scenarios, so the IPCC, okay, is the panel of scientists working under the umbrella of the United Nations to produce a climate consensus for policymakers. That is, you have thousands of scientists among the best which studies are aggregated in a single document every six or seven years that presents the climate consensus, what we know about climate science. It was created at the end of the 1980s, okay, and it's the sixth assessment report, AR, so it's AR6, okay, it's the sixth report that presents a synthesis of what we know about climate science. And that was the first part of the report which is written on the basis of studies of climate scientists. So people like me, economists, work on the third part of the report. Okay, so the first part of the report is climate science. The second part of the report, which will be published in February, is about adaptation. So for example, environmental migration, climate migration, okay? And the third part, which would be published in March, is about mitigation, that is, the policies that we can put in place in order to prevent you know, warming from getting completely out of hand, right? So this is a state of the climate science. And they have scenarios. They, they try different scenarios to see what 
scenarios lead to what outcome? Okay? And you have five scenarios. All the scenarios that are studied lead, converge to a world which is 1.5 degrees warmer than the pre-industrial period. And that's the revelation of this report. I call this the column of fear. Okay? Because frankly, it's frightening. We are heading to a world, it can be as soon as 2030, okay? and it can be as late as 2040, but it's clear, absolutely certain, that we will not avoid a world that is 1.5 degrees warmer than the pre-industrial period. How much has the Earth warmed today compared to the pre-industrial period? Today, as we speak. 1.2 degrees. So it's 1.1. Some studies say 1.2, but it's 1.1, okay? Let's, let's go for the consensus and say that right now, the warming is 1.1 degrees. Open your eyes around the world and see what the world at 1.1 looks like, okay? It's disaster after disaster after disaster, okay? It's grease burning, is uh, Portland, Oregon with 50 degrees uh, heat wave, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's flooding in the south of France, it's flooding in, in Berlin, in, um, sorry, in Germany, in Belgium, etc. Et so you, you see, this is a 1.1 degree world. And it's clear that we are heading to a 1.5 degrees world. So this is the column of fear in the sense that, frankly, this is frightening. And this is also the column of adaptation. Because since we know this is certain, we need to adapt to this. We need to build the collective protections that are going to prevent us from feeling the worst effect of this world. And it's very clear when you look at those disasters that we are not ready. We have not made the investment necessary to face this world. Okay. This is the first information which is crucial to know. And the second information is what I call the line of hope. So this is the column of fear. Okay. And this is the line of hope. And the line of hope is that in one scenario, which is called the SSP1 1.9, okay, in this scenario, the warming goes up to 1.5 degrees, that's certain, but then it stabilizes at, at 1.6 degrees, and then by the end of the 21st century goes down to 1.4 degrees. This is what we should aim for, okay? Because this is going to be the least destructive scenario in terms of human consequences of climate change. So when the press presented the report, they put out some graphs, like this one, where you had the scenarios, but only, you know, with a nice design. And you see that the SSP1 1.9 is really the only viable scenario in terms of consequences. But then the press, for example, Le Monde, presented that and didn't say anything about, by the way, what does it mean, SSP1? You know, when I look at this, I'm curious about only one thing, which is how do we get out of this trap? So what do we need to do in order to achieve this? And absolutely no one in the press talked about what was behind those scenarios. And yet, we know exactly what's behind because this is published science, okay? So you need to go to the paper, and the paper was written in 2017. And in 2017, the people working that the IPCC report actually, uh, you know, uh, that, that the IPCC report built on, on their work, say these are the scenarios we are working on. Okay, and once again, the only thing I'm interested in is what the hell is SSP1, all right? So what does it entail? And so you go to SSP1, and then you have exactly, you know, 10 lines, which is the future of humanity, basically. Okay, so if you want, to combat eco-anxiety, okay, you need to be rational about the reality of climate, you know, crisis, but then you need to know what you need to do in order to avoid the climate chaos. And what you need to do is very clearly spelled out. The only scenario that works for humanity is a scenario in which, I quote, the emphasis on economic growth shift toward a broader emphasis on human well-being driven by an increasing commitment to achieving development goals, inequality is reduced both across and within countries. So as a scholar, as a human, as a father, 
The only thing I'm interested in is how do we do this? Okay, what are the practical means, you know, that will help us shift away from economic growth into a broader conception of human well-being and reduce inequalities? And for this to be achieved, you need a new vision of the economy. You need to go beyond economic growth. So you need to understand that economic growth is a very small part of what really matters in the 21st century, and that we need new indicators and new policies that are focused on human well-being. And this is the way we are going to escape the climate crisis. And the truth is, we have 10 years to do that. Well, actually, nine years and a half. Okay, because it's already September. This, this is what is called the decisive decade. And the decisive decade is not an overstatement. It's true. We really only have 10 years to change completely our economic systems to avoid the climate chaos. And if we don't do it, we will pay a huge price in terms of suffering. But it means doing away with economic growth. There's no way around this. We need absolutely to stop this. This is pure madness. This is destroying the biosphere. And this is destroying human well-being. So as a scholar, the only thing I want to do in the next 10 years is work on that. And this is what I've been doing for the past 10 years, and this is what I will do for the next 10 years. To convince people such as you, but also you know, leaders around the world, or students elsewhere in the US, that this is what we need to do, and that you have a part to play in this revolution. But this is a revolution, okay? And it has not really started yet, okay? So the question is, what exactly does it mean to shift away from economic growth to well-being? What is already being achieved? What do we need as further steps, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. But this is exactly so. The whole point I'm trying to make here is that eco-anxiety is perfectly rational, but what's also rational is to understand that the climate crisis is a manufactured crisis. It's a human crisis. We are doing all those things. So the beautiful thing about it is that we can also correct those things. And we can correct them before they become completely embedded in the biosphere. Because then, if we don't correct them, then it will be just a feedback loop. That is, if we go to 1.5, then we can easily go to 2, and easily to 2.5, and easily to 3. Because basically, you have feedback effects in the biosphere. That is, if you increase the temperature too much, you can completely destroy the Amazon forest. If the Amazon forest is destroyed, it will not, you know, take up carbon, and then you will have even more carbon released. And then you can have the permafrost, you know, completely unfrozen in Siberia, and this will, rele this will release huge amounts of methane, and this will also cause uh, catastrophic climate change. Think about the gigantic fires in a place that I love, which is California. California, which is the center of global capitalism, which is probably the richest place on Earth, is becoming completely uninhabitable. Okay, and why? Because you have this degradation of ecosystems where you have a sort of vicious feedback loop. So those gigantic fires that you see in California, they are worsening climate change. And because you have more climate change, you have more of those, of those fires. Okay. And so I'm receiving you know, alerts on my phone telling me that the air is not breathable on the Stanford campus. That you cannot breathe freely in a city like San Francisco. San Francisco is probably the most, the richest city on the planet. Okay? This is where you have all the tech industry, this is where you have Silicon Valley and everything. All those things are going to be completely destroyed in a matter of 10 to 15 years, if we go on this path. So this is just completely crazy and we need to stop it and we know how. Okay, so, what is well-being? Well-being is a pluralistic vision of human existence. Well-being means that you have different things that you care about as a human. You, not, you don't care only about income. I'm not saying income is not important. Income is important. It is for me and it is for you. It's not just the whole of your life. You have, when you ask people around the world what they care the most about, there are two things that stand up all the time in surveys. The first thing is health. It's not income. It's health. The most important thing for human is health. And the second most important thing, as in what is the thing that makes you the most happy in the world, is social connections, social links, social bonds. 
Okay? You can make the case that those two things, health and social connections, are actually not directly related to income. And certainly not directly related to, to economic growth. Actually, economic growth destroys those two things as we speak. All right? So you feel immediately that well-being is a pluralistic vision. So for example, the United Nations has promoted for the last 30 years the vision of human development. What is human development? And has calculated a human development index. It says very simply that the three things that matter are health, education, and income. And it says if you want to have a sense of how wealthy is a country, you need to measure those two, three things on par. 30%, well, one third, one third, one third. Okay? But just the third of income and say, oh, okay, the US has the highest income per capita, one of the highest income per capita on the planet, so it is the richest country on the planet. No, because if you measure health in the US, you will see that the US falls at 35 in terms of rank, because the health system is just a disaster, as we can see every day with the COVID crisis. And so if you want to have a balanced view of the wealth of the US, you need at least you know, income and health. And then you have a sense that something is wrong with how much is invested in the health system. And that's very useful for public policy. Right? So well-being is this, you know, a pluralistic vision. And of course, you don't have only education, health, and income. You have trust, you have democracy, you have freedoms, you have happiness. All those things need to be measured and they need to be, to be valued. Okay? So it can be subjective. I can ask you if you are happy, you know, for example, happy with this lecture, okay? Or if you are happy in your life, this is subjective. Or I can measure your life expectancy, and this is objective. So I have many, many ways, many tools to measure those things. And I want subjective, I want objective, because sometimes it's interesting, for example, that the French are quite wealthy in terms of education, health, and income. They are not really happy in terms of life satisfaction. And there is a disconnect between the two. You can say this is because the French are always angry, you know. <laughs> because all the French are like Parisians, which is not true, okay? Parisians is a certain species of French, okay? If you go with the French people in Montpellier, they are not like Parisians. And they are really, you know, I mean, they are, they are not sure that Parisians are even French, okay? So, but there is something here that the French maybe like to complain, or maybe they fear that they might lose what they have, and this is what they say, that they are not really happy, or they want more, or they want less, or there are thousands of explanations, which are really, really interesting. When Amartya Sen uh, studied the well-being of, uh, of women and men in India, he found out that you know, women were always better off than men. And he concluded it's because, well, women are really miserable. A lot of them are miserable in some places in India, and they started, they stopped complaining about it. Okay, and the, and the men complain. And so in a way to complain might be a sign that you are actually doing well. Okay, so this is why it's complicated to study subjective data, but it's also very interesting because it's very interesting to ask, you know, and mental health, you can only assess mental health via subjective data. You can assess mental health via suicide rates, but it's not going to tell you a lot, for example, about depression post-COVID, you know. If you want to study the mental health of French students, you might want to have a big survey of, you know, mental health. Ask people how they feel like. And the French government is not interested in, in knowing that. The French government has not put in place a huge study of how French students, you know, are doing mentally, which is probably one of the critical issues for the future of this country, you know the scars that COVID is leaving on the mental health of young people, right? So if you want to, if you think that this is part of the wealth of your country, you want to measure this, and you want to value this, okay? And you want to make sure that it's visible. So subjective and objective, it's individual and it's collective. I can measure my own well-being, but also the well-being of a community, of a nation, of a group. And it's static and it's also, it's also dynamic in the sense that I want to know how I'm doing right now in terms of well-being, but also have a sense of how I will do in the next 10 years or 20 years. And for that, you need to factor in environmental conditions. Okay? It's not enough to say that people in Paris you know, are very wealthy with Dior. We are right now at the center of the center of the rich world. There's no question about it. All right? And yet, if you have heat wave after heat wave after heat wave in Paris, the well-being of people is going to be destroyed in a matter of just five years, if they are not protected. 
And this is resilience. And this is sustainability. So this is a dynamic vision of well-being, right? So this is what you want to know, I want to measure. And it goes way beyond the question of economic growth and GDP. So the agenda, frankly, of well-being and not just indicators, but also well-being policies, because what matters right now is really policies. I'm, I'm, I'm starting a new class in Sciences Po this fall, which is called Building Well-Being Policies, and where we, we work with students on building well-being policies, because we are beyond the question of indicators. We have hundreds of indicators. The question is now, how do we change policy with those new visions? Okay? So the agenda has never been so vibrant, and it was, frankly, revived by a report, which was called the Stiglitz Report, named after Joe Stiglitz, uh, where you had uh, Martia Sen also participating, a number of very high-ranking economists. Unfortunately, they were almost all economists and almost all men, right? Which was a bit like, you know, 20th century conception of 21st century well-being. Uh, because, of course, if you put those people in a room and you ask those people to define what well-being is, you're not going to have, you know, especially innovative vision of what well-being is. So th this was already problematic. But there are two things that were problematic in the report. The report, you can read it, it's really interesting, it tells you a lot of things on the progress, on the, on the limitation, etc. The problem, what it misses, it misses first a comprehensive understanding of well-being, and by that I mean how do we connect well-being with sustainability? How do we connect well-being today with well-being tomorrow? That is the big question. There's no doubt that we have made huge progress in terms of poverty alleviation around the world. Okay? huge reduction in poverty. The problem is that you could have, in the next 10 years, 700 million people going back to poverty because of climate change, right? So that's really a question of how do you connect well-being with sustainability, and this is where I've, I've tried to make some progress with, with, the, with the, the figure I'm going to show at the end. That is a comprehens comprehensive vision of well-being. And the second agenda was what I was talking about, which is how do you build well-being policies and not just well-being indicators. That is, how do you operationalize those indicators and make sure that people use them actually, right? Because you know the French government, when you talk with a French official or, you know, I've talked with the mayor of Paris, for example, about that, they would say, of course we want some well-being indicators, of course we are all for well-being. Well-being is fun, well-being is super nice, we want well-being indicators. And then they do nothing with it. That is, they publish the report and then nothing changes, right? So we need to have really strategies to engage policymakers and citizens in order to make this happen. Okay, so what was the strategy as of uh, today? There were three ages of escaping growth. This is really a long, long fight, but these are the best fights, you know, the fights that last for decades and then in the end you win. Of course, if at the end you lose, it was not such a great fight. But, uh, you know, all the fights, the, the fights we're fighting take a very long time to win. I mean, emancipation of women, abolition of slavery, all those things, you know, it's not like, you know, you snap and then everything is fine. It's basically you go back and forth for 50 years and then in the end you make a progress which actually is vulnerable to regressions always vulnerable to regressions, okay? So, the first moment when growth was criticized as such was right in the middle of an industrial revolution. That is right when we were inventing modern economic growth. You had one of the most influential economists of all times, which is John Stuart Mill, fantastic economist, okay? And he wrote about the steady state. Okay, so when people today are talking about degrowth and arguing that degrowth is such a new agenda, well, John Stuart Mill had degrowth on his radar, you know, 150 years ago. He talked about the fact that we need to cool down the economic machine and, and move to a steady state economy because we are destroying the biosphere. In the middle of the 19th century, you know, the guy had not a lot of internet, okay, and he was able to, to know and be informed that there were huge destruction of the biosphere taking place around him. And he understood that this was due, and this was greatly accelerated by industrial capitalism, which would soon be financial capitalism, which is, still to, which is today tech capitalism, and it's destroying the planet. 
And tech, by the way, tech capitalism, okay, is probably destroying the planet much more than financial and industrial capitalism. The idea that we are living in a, a dematerialized economy thanks to technology is a fantasy. We have never consumed so much of natural resources. We are consuming three times more natural resources today than in 1970. Okay, there's a new book that just came out which is titled um, At the End of a Like. At the End of a Like. So you put a like on the internet and the author is saying how much does a like weight on the biosphere? Okay, that's the point of departure of the book. And the idea is that, you know, you send email, you like photos, you download photos, you go on Instagram, etc., etc. This is all very costly in environmental terms. Okay, the idea that this is just, you know, we are in the cloud, this is a joke. Okay, we are never, we have never consumed so much of natural resources, and of course, all the tech industry is consuming a huge amount of it. All right, so... In the middle of the 19th century, industrial growth, no internet, but still some heavy destructions. And John Stuart Mill said, let's, let's cool it off, all right? Let's find another way to define what we can do in common. Then the Meadows Report, you may have heard about, the, uh, who has heard about the Meadows Report? Limits to growth, the Meadows? Okay, so some of you, good. So 1972, Donatella and Dennis Meadows from MIT uh, build a model right, in which they are trying a number of scenarios and one of those scenarios is called uh, sustain and collapse and sustain and collapse scenario means that yes we can enjoy some growth for the next 30 to 40 years and then we will have a collapse of the biosphere if we don't take care of you know, environmental degradation so basically some people say that the Meadows team had it right in 1972 that they were able to foresee what is going to happen except at that time no one was talking about climate change which is just incredible okay 1972 the big concern then was overpopulation and pollution not climate change but at the end of the 1970s you had Exxon Mobil working on climate change and producing the best research on climate change and this is why they are on trial today because they are on trial for hiding very good data and information that they had back in, at the end of the 1970s, knowing that climate change was happening. Okay. So, 1972, you had this idea that the biosphere might collapse under the weight of the economy. Okay. 1972, Tobin and Nordos, uh, which will both win uh, the so-called Nobel Prize in Economics. There is no Nobel Prize in Economics. Okay. Never. Nobel never wanted economists to receive a Nobel Prize because in his will, Nobel wanted people to receive his money because he was, of course, the inventor of the TNT and he wanted to redeem his soul and he wanted to give his money to people advancing the fate of humanity. Economists are not advancing the fate of humanity. Okay, no. They are building theoretical models that don't have anything to do with the reality. So, of course, Nobel didn't want economists to receive a Nobel Prize and the Nobel Prize was invented in 1969 by the Bank of Sweden to give a sense that economics is a science, which is not. Okay, so the Nobel Prize is 1969, okay? And 1969, only two women received the Nobel Prize, the Nobel Prize in economics. One of them is French, Esther Duflo. The other one is Elinor Osdron. And uh, Tobin and Nordos, 1972, write a paper in which they built an alternative indicator to GDP. So this is the empirical age. So this is really philosophical criticism of growth. This is not uh, uh, an end that's worth pursuing. This is an empirical criticism of growth. We can build alternative indicators to GDP and use them instead of GDP to guide our economic policy. Okay. Now the age in which we are in is the political age. And frankly, that's the most exciting age of criticizing GDP and criticizing growth because this is where, where we, ha we get our hands dirty, right? So political means institutional. This is, what, this is what transitions are about. Transitions are about institutions, changing institutions. And political started with a conference organized by the European Commission of all places in 2007 that was called Beyond GDP. And then you had the vote of the SDGs. Okay, by the United Nations in September 2015. And in September 2015, the United Nations 
all the member states okay, say the way we define progress is not with economic growth or GDP per capita. It is with 17 indicators, a pluralistic view of a success, what a, a successful nation is uh, in uh, the 21st century. And now this political age is being accelerated at least at, in two places. One is the Well-Being Economy Alliance, okay, and of which I am a research fellow and I'm working with them, which is a collective working with governments directly to try to have those indicators built in the political process. And the most advanced countries in the world when it comes to well-being policies are New Zealand, on the one hand, okay, New Zealand that has voted the first well-being budget in 2019, Okay, the first well-being budget of all times was voted in New Zealand, and New Zealand is headed, is headed by a young woman, and I think it's no, not a coincidence that you, know, you have a lot of those uh, governments that are actually headed by young women. Okay? So New Zealand, Finland is the other country which is the most advanced, and we all is also working with Scotland and with Iceland. So the idea is to say, okay, let's not try to build a theoretical indicator or best indicator and then see who can adopt. Let's work directly with the countries and see how exactly we can change the process of, for example, voting a budget. You know, I, I can tell you, I spoke with tens and tens of members of parliaments, of the French parliaments over the years. They know next to nothing about the state of France, you know. Because the indicators that they have is just macroeconomic indicators like GDP, investment, consumption. They don't even know the state of inequality. I mean, when you vote a budget, the first thing that you should be concerned with, especially in France, is the state of inequality. That is having you know, at least five indicators of inequality where you have a sense of where they are and where they are moving in the, in the, la in the last 10 years. And they don't know it. Okay? And of course, they know nothing about the state of the environment, biodiversity, birds, you name it. Okay? So, the idea is we all okay, doing some fantastic job with governments. And the donut economy, which is Kate Raworth, and Kate Raworth has made some breakthrough this year, convincing Amsterdam to actually, and Brussels to adopt the donut economy. So this is really national level and this is really local level. And this is super exciting because this is well-being policies you know, coming true exactly at the right moment. And once you have a big city like Amsterdam or Brussels and you have a big, well, maybe it's a small country to you, but for me it's a huge country when I look at what they did with COVID, which is New Zealand. At least it's not a negligible country. Okay, then it's, you start to change the conversation. And this is why I've tried, I can tell you, I try to convince the people in Paris to adopt a well-being indicator, they won't. Okay, and I did the same thing with Geneva, and they won't also. So the fight is still going on. We need to convince more people to adopt them, but this is changing. So this is the SDGs, okay, the 17 indicators. A lot of things, you know, strike you when you look at this. Uh, the first is, I don't understand the color codes, and I don't understand the design, and I don't see at all, you know, a clear vision of well-being and sustainability when I look at this. It's completely flat. You might say, oh, but the color codes mean something. No, they don't mean anything. Okay, the reason why this is red and this is, this is red and this is uh, uh, green and red has nothing to do with uh, their vision of well-being. So it's really nice. It's really nice because it says that economic growth is here. It exists, but it's really small. You know, it's half of an indicator or among 17 indicators. And that's the real message, revolutionary message of the SDGs. But it's hidden, basically, with this. All right? So you need to have visions that at least allow you to have a sense of how to organize well-being. So this is one design I came up with. I'm not saying it's perfect and it has much less color than the UN, but it has more meaning. All right? And the, the thing I'm trying to convey with this is that you have different, different layers of well-being. You, know, you start with economic well-being. Economic well-being is important. Okay? I have a job and I have income and I'm really happy about this. I'm not saying this is unimportant. All right? This is income, this is jobs. The GDP already is disqualified as a good indicator for this. Because you can have very strong economic growth and not a lot of growth for income of people and not a lot of job creation. Okay, and then you widen the lens 
on the complexity of the world. And you find out that there is education, health, happiness, free time. This is human well-being. You widen again and you have social well-being with inequality, institution and trust. And you widen again, you have resilience. How is this going to resist shocks? And you widen again and you have the compatibility with the biosphere. And this makes sense because it looks like the Earth, or let's say an egg Earth uh, form, okay? But it looks like the biosphere, okay? And if this collapses, this will collapse also. But the opposite is not true. So this is the idea to come up with you know, some interesting visualization. And I can, I know what this is, theoretically, and I know how to measure all those things. I can give you a good indicator for all those things for tens and tens and tens of countries around the world. I can build a good indicator for all those dimensions for France. And it would show very different results than just GDP. And I can do this at the community level up until the UN for all the countries in the world. Right? So this is why it's more practical than the vision of the SDGs. So this was about you know, trying to embed, trying to First of all, think hard about those indicators and make sure that they fit into policy. Now, let's go back to the other agenda question that I had and then I will, I will finish. What about the vision? Okay, what about, because frankly, if you want to change the world, you need to have a narrative. Okay? Humans are about stories. You might hate it, you might say this is absurd, uh, we are rational beings, we don't want to hear stories. No, we are about stories. Okay? We are about stories and storytelling. So you need to have a good narrative. Economic growth is a hugely powerful narrative because it tells you that once you have this, all the good things you want, you can have them also, which is not true. This is empirically false. Okay? I can show you studies after studies showing this is not true okay? or not true anymore. And yet people still believe it. Okay? So if you want to work on a new vision, you need to work on institutions. You also need to work on imaginaries and narratives. Okay? So, some scientists have teamed up and produced a new narrative, which is the planetary boundaries narrative. And the narrative is quite compelling. The idea is there is a safe operating space for humanity. You, you, you will notice that France is at the center of the world, which is how it's supposed to be. Okay? France is always at the center of everything, and Paris is at the center of France. So right now, you are at the center, exactly the right center of the world, right, as we speak. So this is a safe operating space. This is the green space, okay? We are okay if we stay within those boundaries. But if somehow our economic activities make us cross those boundaries because we produce too much CO2, because we produce too much, you know, ozone depletion substances, we are going to enter a danger zone. We are not going to be safe. We are going to cross those planetary boundaries. And so the paper, there were two papers, the last paper, 2015, tries, tries to calculate those boundaries, say this is safe, this is where we are, so we are not safe for a number of boundaries that we have crossed. Okay, this is strong, and this has been hugely influential, frankly, uh, in the global community, but there is a problem. The problem with this is that we have the feeling that this is humanity with a great H causing ecological crisis with a great E that will affect humanity with a great H. It's not the case. Okay? Climate change is the result of the action of 20 countries that produce 75% of CO2 emissions. And in the world, 50% of all emissions are the consequence of the action of 10% of the people. 10% of the individuals on the planet produce 50% of greenhouse gas emissions. So the problem is, how do we see social systems here in terms of the causes and then how do we see the social consequences of those crises? Because this is not like, oh, we are at 1.1 degrees Celsius and we are all affected the same with climate change. No, it's not the case. Okay? There are some groups and, minori and, and, and minorities and a number of people which are much more affected than others. So you don't see the social differentiation in terms of causes, responsibility, and you don't see it in terms of vulnerability, in terms of consequences, all right? So you don't see the social systems. And enter Kate Rayworth. Kate Rayworth presents a new narrative. So if you haven't read her book, I really highly recommend reading her book, 
donut economy thinking like a 21st uh, uh, century economist. The first chapter is devoted to the power of visualization and the power of design. How designing things actually matter for conveying ideas, right? And, this, and she says, I didn't want to, you know, study long and hard neoclassical economics and then think about a way to make it, you know, coherent. I wanted to start off with something completely, you know, out of the usual. And she came up with the idea of the donut, saying, all right, so we have the planetary boundaries, but we want to see the social system. So let's build a social floor, a social foundation to complement the ecological ceiling. And let's define a space which is not just safe, but safe and just for humanity, where we have the most of this without crossing this. Okay? Hence the donut economy. And you can measure all those indicators, see where we are in terms of how much of the floor we have built and how much of the ceiling we have, you know, uh, um, expanded. But there is also a problem with this. And the problem I have with this is that I don't see the connection between the two circles. I see that you have two circles, but it's almost like they are ignoring one another. What I want to see is if I do something in terms of health, what consequence is going to have for this boundary. Or if this boundary is crossed, what consequence is going to have on housing? Right. And you don't see it. it. There's no connection. This moves independently from this. Okay. So what I end up drawing myself was a way to connect the two circles. Okay. And this is really what my book and my vision is about, is a social ecological feedback loop, which is not vicious, but which is actually harmonious, okay? Whereby I have the social circle interlocked with the natural circle in an infinity loop, which makes the whole thing stable. So I presented this to someone very senior in the health community and she said to me, I feel trapped in your loop. I cannot escape. I'm like going this and then and, then, and, then, and I cannot escape. And my students in Sciences Po said, well, no, Professor, this is actually reassuring to know that we are in a stable system, that we are not going, you know, to go into chaos, because this is really what we are frightened of, afraid of, you know, to go into chaos. So the idea is to connect this and to see the nods, the critical connection between the two worlds, the social system and the natural system, which is really one and only um, codependent world. And the two nods, is what I call the sustainability justice nexus, whereby inequality is connected to sustainability. That is, the more sustainable the world is going to be, the more just it's going to be, and the more just it's going to be, the more sustainable it's going to be. Okay? And the other nod is the full health nexus, which is that human health basically has no meaning without being connected to biodiversity and ecosystem health. And full means that it's physical, biological, but also mental. It's individual and social, and it's ecological, right? And there you work on the connection and how to make the whole system work, right? But this is a vision, okay? And the two narratives, the full health narrative is that we can enjoy our social bonds if we take care of our natural links, okay? If we want to enjoy our social bonds, we need to take care of our natural links. And that's the, for me, the most important lesson from COVID, the most important lesson from COVID is that if we don't take care of the natural links that we have, that is taking care of ecosystems and biodiversity, if we continue deforestation, if we continue to destroy those areas where we have a great risk of having no zoonoses, that is of having natural viruses coming into humans because the frontier between humans and animals is, no, is really uh, narrow, then we can end up like on April 7, 2020, with 4 billion people locked down. And what those people were deprived of was their social bonds. What we have suffered from is not the loss of economic growth. What we have suffered from is the fact that we have lost what makes our life worthwhile, which is social connections. The ability to like, to love, not on Facebook, in real life, that is in life. Okay. And this is really the great lesson from COVID. If you end up, you know, 
catching a bat, putting it in a P4 high security lab, whatever the origin of COVID is, you will find the exploitation, the over-exploitation of natural resources and non-human species. Whether it's through the wet market in Wuhan or the P4 lab in Wuhan, okay, you still have the same problem, which is humans are treating other natural beings as resources, as instruments for their own well-being. If we continue to do this, what we will end up doing is destroying the heart of our humanity, which is social bonds. So this is the first narrative, and the second narrative is that our world would be more just if it is more sustainable, and more sustainability becomes more just. What does it mean? Well, think about the Gilets jaunes, okay? The Gilets jaunes crisis in Paris, okay, because in this city it's beautiful, I mean, since 2015 we go from one crisis to another, okay, so it's like terrorist attack and then strikes and then Gilets jaunes and then COVID, you know, it's just a beautiful thing. I was born in the city, I mean, I'm, I'm really starting to, to think that I should leave it right now uh, before the next crisis comes. But the Gilets jaunes crisis, which was the crisis right before COVID, was about people in France revolting because the carbon tax had been increased from 44 euros to 55 euros without any form of social compensation. What the Gilets jaunes tells you is not that it's impossible to do environmental policy that will not harm people. It's that environmental policy can hurt people if you don't make sure that there are social compensations. So this is really this narrative in the sense of you will not be able to do a transition policy in a world of inequality. People won't accept it. Right. So right now you have this craziness on the energy markets as we speak, you know, with gas and, and people might say, oh, this is good. This is good for the transition because, you know, uh, people you must pay a higher price for their fuels. No, it's not good because this is the market being completely blind to any kind of climate issue and any kind of social effects. And this is going to anger people against rising prices. So what we should have right now is a conversation of you know, how to make this energy transition really a just transition. Because otherwise, people won't accept it. Right? So this is basically the narrative. If you want to know more, I will send the slides to uh, This is the books I've been read, uh, that I've written in the last three years, both in French and in English. They're all about what I've talked uh, about today, okay. If you can read French, and if you have this one and this one, for 15 euros, you have all my thoughts, you know. So it's a good bargain, all right. This will be out uh, next month. This is already out. And the rest is, yeah, English and French, but this is all about the same topic. That is, well-being beyond economic growth and connecting environmental issues to social issues, which are two things that we should do actually uh, together. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Um, well, hello everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you for being here and special thank you for uh, Monsieur Laurent, the author, for uh, presenting your work with us, sharing it with us and giving us the opportunity to discuss it. Um, Um, as you already probably already read this paper, it's by the European Trade Union Institute, and we'll be quickly uh, we'll be starting real quickly by critiquing the, tri the trilemma and the three um, scenarios that it presents. Then my classmate Rodrigo will debunk the need for growth, and then my uh, classmate Peter will present the strategies for viable uh, alternatives. In uh, 2019, the European Green Deal. Uh, proposed a new growth strategy based on targeting um, economic efficiency. And remember this word efficiency because we'll be discussing it later. Um, the problem with this, uh, with this new growth strategy is that after all the ecological crisis we've been having and after an, the ongoing pandemic we're living right now, the challenging global context is calling for a deep revaluation of these um, growth-based economic objectives we have been following so far. The, ecolo the ecological and social issues should be addressed and mitigated together, yes. Um, and by explaining this trilemma and by uh, criticizing the, the limitations of these two scenarios, we will argue that it's not even necessary to call it a trilemma because it's not even, there's no a debate, there's no a doubt which, trans which scenario we should follow, which is the just transition. It's the only, uh, it's the most viable scenario and it's the only viable scenario. Um, 
So let's start, shall we? First, with social democracy. Uh, according to the Finnish researcher uh, Hir Pilami, this cumulative virtue circle um, it uh, sets in motion, well, it works with uh, relating economic growth with social development. Um, in, for, this, for this virtue circle, the GDP growth is the dynamo that sets this circle in motion, and it's, uh, it's a cycle because uh, economic growth um, it fosters, economic, it fosters social development, and social development goes back to economic growth in a positive way. Uh, that's how it's work in theory. In theory, GDP growth uh, generates and requires mass production, mass production and consumption, which leads to full employment, improving tax revenues, uh, increasing social policy, extending uh, social protection, reducing inequality, and uh, uh, increasing um, well-being, which all of this is ways for continue to produce and to consume. This is how it's supposed to work in theory. But in reality, uh, this is how it actually works. This closed circuit actually leaves behind the biosphere. It ignores the, uh, economic, the impacts of the environment from economical um, growth, and it ignores uh, the sustainability issue. Um, so this, uh, well, yeah, this is how it works in reality. And we can see that in this ecological crisis that we're living right now, it's debatable to, to call this virtuous circle actually virtuous. It's really debatable to call it, to call it like that. Um, and so, yeah, it's not, it's not a viable solution because it's not sustainable. Now, with the a scenario of green growth, as I already mentioned, the European Green Deal has the objective of reaching a sustainable and inclusive growth through uh, the increasing uh, European GDP while reducing emissions. As we already, as we already saw on the paper, uh, this is a contradictory plan to follow. Why? Why do we keep basing policies on GDP growth? By definition, mathematically, GDP is only the measure of final production in an economy. It doesn't measure how it's produced, it doesn't measure how uh, the production affects the environment, it doesn't measure how uh, the gains in this production are, distrib are distributed. So it's a very limited indicator and we're still using it for our policies. Um, and it's, it's interesting that a deal of this, of this, uh, with this impact of this size still based itself on, on GDP. Uh, and it's not enough to, to respond to the ecological and, and well-being requirements that we need today. Then, if we focus exclusively and, stricti and strictly on uh, increasing GDP growth, um, we will be entering into a paradox. If we focus on uh, economic efficiency, we might be entering into a paradox where actually increasing efficiency might be increasing, at the end of the day, consumption and emissions. Why? Um, in theory, uh, the, the um, uh, environmental efficiency is supposed to help for the decoupling between economic growth and emissions and environmental impact. But as we well already saw on this paper, this decoupling is an illusion. It's a myth. Um, even though there might be European industries that, uh, in fact, uh, manage to reduce the emissions they, they produce per unit per output, thanks to the um, in technological efficiency, economic growth will continue to surpass the, the impact of these of this emissions. Economic growth continues to surpass this, um, this, um, this efficiency. So we'll get to a point where efficiency is not enough. Uh, this rebound effect, uh, w where efficiency is surpassed by economic growth, might, te might be telling us that a zero net growth policy might be the best alternative, where moderation, and not efficiency necessarily, but moderation, is the key to more, a more sustainable future. And uh, now my classmate Rodrigo will continue with the next scenario, which is just transition. Thank you, Hania, for the nice presentation. And then, as Hania just presented, uh, we need to move beyond growth, and for that we need to analyze the just transition. And then the best to do that is to analyze the origins of the welfare state. Then the authors point at uh, the age of uh, 1870 as uh, one of the origins, of the origin of the welfare state, by globalization and uh, by precarity in the conditions of the uh, works and. Uh, uh, sorry. <laughs> then, uh, through the precarity and the conditions of works, 
uh, than through laws and regulations. Uh, the, that was the origins of the welfare state. Then I would add in the analysis the Marxist uh, ideas and the Marxist importance in that period for work is uh, really pushing up the, for more democracy and for better world conditions. And also about the first generation of the human rights and so on and so far. And then really it was a movement for democracy and for people pushing up and not really about the, the fiscal capacity and so on. Then the second state was in the golden age of capitalism between 1945 and 1980. Uh, it's about social guarantees, we can speak about Keynes and the second generation of human rights. And just an example, the authors point that uh, in 1945, we have uh, developed for like 10% of the spends in social guarantees and uh, it gets twice of it in 90. 80, and before that, in the early 90s, it was like around 1%. Then it, it important just really to highlight here that the following and the, the search for uh, the social guarantees was not something about really income and uh, growth, but was really about democratic movement and to face a social stability against the growth instability. Then, next slide. Here it's a really important idea that uh, usually we tend to link growth with employment and income, but then the authors argue that there is a decoupling between growth and employment, and many times also an absolute decoupling between uh, growth and employment. Uh, in many countries like US, Germany, and also the European Union in general, and also there is a not the link between growth and income necessarily, speaking about household incomes, because many times this growth goes to inequality, as we can see in the case of US between 1993 and uh, 2018, something like 85% of the increase in GDP went to the 10% richest part of the population. And also, it not necessarily increase the fiscal capacity because social competition, and then sometimes it's very hard to tax it, and then it doesn't really mean that uh, it will return somehow in fiscal capacity. Another point that is really important is that uh, growth is not really a good measure of development and not of well-being. For example, here we can see that 85% of the well-being that we achieved in the last years, uh, in the last decade, can be explained by really uh, the welfare system, the welfare state, investment in health and education, and not by growth itself. And then we must really act directly in the parameters that stabilize the social policies in the long term, such as uh, labor productivity, household income, sharing aid value, demography, and so on and so far. And also a question that I put here as economists, really sometimes we need to stop thinking about growth and some things and to focus more in the real part of the economy, like real and versus fictitious, and also to think a bit about all the deficiencies of GDP. Uh, by this, uh, also the welfare state, it's much more efficient uh, than the private sphere. For example, the example of US that have a private health system, uh, they used to spend twice the amount of what the average of OECD countries spend in health system, and it's much more inefficient uh, than the other health systems in the world. Uh, just in absolute term, the healthcare production in US, uh, it's more than the entire French economy. Then we should focus really in equity and social protection to have a social stability. And for less, there is a positive relation between social protection and productivity. Uh, thank you, I will pass to Peter. Yes, so thank you also from me for the brilliant presentation earlier. Um, you also put forward, so it's kind of clear hopefully to everyone that we need a just transition now and that for that we need a uh, social ecological state, an updated welfare state that enables and sustains this just transition. So you put forward in the paper three 
and also in the book, I believe, three uh, policies or strategies to go beyond growth without needing growth anymore. So the first one is that we can, of course, increase wealth and carbon taxes and therefore have the money for redistribution, as you were alluding to right now, and for investments in ecological moderation and redistribution. Secondly, and I'll go on, on into this on more detail in the next slide, of course, an, no, uh, yeah, uh, an, an ambitious environmental policy can bring us all of these benefits and a virtual, uh, virtuous social ecological loop you were alluding to. And as a third point, of course, a social ecological protection system. So the welfare state now is not built for the crises we are going to face in the coming decades. Um, you could see that with the IPCC report, but also now you have attribution science which can really tell us that specific extreme weather events are attributable to climate change. So we have, for instance, the, the heat waves, in, which are a particular problem in France, which we talk about, but also now the, the recent floodings in Germany, which are going to cost the German state more than 50 billion euros in rebuilding, and we need to pool our risk for this. We need to be prepared for it, and also, why did so many people die in Germany in these floodings? There was no proper warning system, and it did not work whatsoever. So we really need to prepare ourselves for this. Now, I'm, I'm just going to quickly talk about the health environment nexus, which you already nicely introduced um, and put forward two points especially related to energy so within the European Union we could save 500,000 premature deaths could be prevented by the end of air pollution additionally if you look at the cost of the deployment of renewables actually they are massively outweighed by the benefits to a factor of 15 to 1 as you've also pointed out. So there's really, we should be talking about the co-benefits of transitions and not the costs of transition. Um, however, and this is now my question where, where I'm very curious about what your position is, so are these three proposals sufficient for the scale of our ecological crises? You already mentioned that there are quite a lot. Here's a, here's a lo quite long list of additional things which are quite problematic and so I would argue we need to systemically we need systemic change, as <laughs> EPOG uh, <laughs> states, uh, but we really need to address the power structures and mechanism that drive this over-exploitation of the biosphere. So we need to end the cost shifting that exists, we, especially to the global south, to the biosphere, and that really needs addre means addressing also the military-industrial complex, it means addressing neo-colonialist structures. And on the other hand, satisfying human needs for all. So potentially for a foundational economy approach where it's much, much more efficiently if we have public luxury for all than private luxury. You can see that with just the example of cycling lanes in Paris, for instance. Um, and this already starting to go into the question now is why growth is seen and not capital is seen. There was one quote, this, this one quote here, which got me wondering a bit because so you argue that some countries are growthist but not capitalist, such as China. And I'm wondering whether China not, doesn't also have a massive amount of capital, capital accumulation, the motive of capital accumulation at the moment, as well as is China really the most unsustainable country as it is producing so much for our consumption? Um, and then on the other hand, countries like Japan, I mean, are a special case because they have a massively declining population. So we'll go quickly to our questions now. Well, yeah, just to finish already with the questions. Uh, well, it's not nothing new. Several economists have talked about uh, building uh, alternatives to GDP, uh, like Cosnet, Stiglitz, uh, building a dashboard of, of more inclusive, more complete indicators. Uh, is there any indicator that you would uh, um, put in that uh, dashboard, like uh, essentially? And in, it's a pluralist of, of indicators, yes, but is any indicator that it's like it, there is a must there should be? Um, to build our policies on based on those and uh, outside of the European context, outside of the examples of USA, of China, uh, going into more of the developing overexploited countries in the, so in the global south, how would these indicators work or how, how can this be applied to those uh, developing countries? Then in the text I, I think that you had like an, a growth perspective then I built my question in a soft uh, perspective as well. Then considering that rich countries have a much higher level of material and energy use than the rest of the world, then is it not unfair to adopt an 
agrowth instead of degrowth uh, perspective on that sense, because especially given that the impossibility of everyone having the European material and energy level of consumption within the ecological boundaries, then how would it be? And just to, to conclude, coming back to my questions, are these strategies sufficient and do we not also need to address the capital accumulation motive and thus the capitalist scene? And yeah, we'll, we'll pass back over to you. Uh, can you leave, actually, can you leave the, the screen? If I want to answer... Yes. Huh? Okay, so I can leave it. I, I, I'll, yeah. You have questions on top of those? Because I need three I'll, hours I'll to answer those yes. questions. <laughs> yeah. Just try to, to, to I, I have only a quick question. No, no, I think what's better is I answer first those questions because they are, yes. first of all, excellent and they are difficult, right? And then I, I'll go to your questions, all right? So let's do this. Okay, so I will. So I will, I will take, so first of all, thank you very much for the discussion. Uh, you were able to summarize. So a bit about the paper. The paper, if you want to change the system, you need to engage with players, right? So I wrote this paper at the invitation of the Research Institute of Trade Unions at the EU level. Why is this important? Because so much of our policy is being decided at the EU level. So the French government is not enough actually to decide all those things. And you might be aware that at the EU level there is a very important discussion going on around the Green Deal. The idea that the EU has a new strategy for the next 10 years which is called the Green Deal. I think the conversation is not focused enough on the fact that the Green Deal should be a well-being strategy. Okay, right now it is presented by the European Commission as a new growth strategy, which worries me a lot. So I, I wanted first to write a paper at the EU level because now is the time to try to have some impact on the conversation. Then trade unions. Why trade unions? Because trade unions are actually quite conservative in their approach to growth because they think that growth can bring jobs and income. And if you ask, you know, trade unionists around the world just you know intuitively are you for degrowth they are probably will scream at you like we are already you know in a difficult position and you want degrowth this is crazy okay the workers won't accept it because it means less income and you know less jobs so it's not possible so they are very important players to engage with if you want to convince them that so the whole paper is built around something that I'm trying to do which is convincing them that actually what they think is the pillar of jobs on the one hand and income on the other is not the case. So I try to show to them that actually more growth does, doesn't mean more income and more jobs, that the things are disconnected, right? And then that growth is actually harming what they care most about, which is the social system. Okay, so this is why the paper is structured like this. So really great thanks for you to having perfectly summarized and added to the paper each time. So, so uh, you first, you uh, added the question of the Jevons effect. It's not in the paper. I don't talk about the fact that this is a rebound effect and Jevons effect, and this is the case. This is absolutely true to say that my argument is around the idea that you can have more carbon efficiency and yet more emissions because of rebound effects. It was very nice to have this. You added the fact that there are two periods, one Marxist and the other Keynesians, and I don't make the distinct distinction in the paper. So it was really nice to see it, and you got it exactly right. It's true that you have a, uh, a period that goes from the foundation of the welfare state in the 1880s to the uh, Second World War, and then a second period. And, the, and the, what you said about those two periods is very true. And what you added, which is, of course, the uh, 20 trillion dollars question, which is, oh, by the way, is this any good if we don't change capitalism, which of course is the big question on everyone's mind, uh, was really nice also. So now I'm going to go to your questions. Very good questions. What are the most important indicators in which policy should be based to properly work towards a healthier, sustainable future? My answer is life expectancy. Okay, My book in French, the book that will be out in paperback in three weeks, which is called what if health guided the world? Et si la santé guidait le monde? The subtitle is L'espérance de vie vaut mieux que la croissance. Life expectancy is worth more than growth. 
And my argument is to say that we have a very good indicator of development in life expectancy. Because life expectancy, first of all, can be calculated at every age. Uh, it's very uh, good predictor of the, um, the fate of, of nations. And also, you can, uh, you can calculate healthy life expectancy. And you will find the difference between life expectancy and healthy disability-free life expectancy. And you will see how the health system works. And because of the work that's been done by the Lancet on the connection between climate change and health, health is actually the place where you see the most clearly the connection between social system and, and uh, environmental system. So I think life expectancy is the good indicator. And it works for developed countries and for developing countries also. Okay? You have major crisis of life expectancy around the world and lowering of life expectancy because of COVID. And you see very important differences uh, between different countries in the world. So I think where, where income is problematic is to say, oh yeah, but uh, developing countries need a minimal income before thinking about you know, having a steady state. At least they need, so that's the question of sufficiency. But real life expectancy, it's true, and, and, and there are many good papers being published around this idea of essential services and sufficiency. What is sufficiency, okay? How, uh, how much is enough, basically? And, and, and why you shouldn't go over a certain threshold which is just superficial and just harming the biosphere for almost no gain in terms of well-being. But you also need a universal indicator, which is life expectancy, in my view. Okay? So all the health indicators, life expectancy, also inequality uh, in health, uh, and of course the, all the, the, the environmental inequality, it's, it's really a dashboard, and what I call full health. It's a dashboard in which life expectancy plays the central role. Okay, so that's my answer. Um, considering the country have a much higher level, uh, so the question, why not degrowth, basically? Okay, degrowth is very popular at the moment. Not just in academic journals, you don't, it, it's, it's funny when I, I see degrowth people, you know, uh, being um, um, basically taken as clowns by politicians, they don't realize that actually degrowth scholars are publishing in the most influential journals on the planet. So you have papers by degrowth people in nature and, and basically so it's just it, it's uh, uh, there are very strong academics working on degrowth and very good work being done around degrowth. My perspective is not degrowth or agrowth or post growth. So you have two paradigms at the moment. You have degrowth and post growth. Okay? And they are both gaining momentum. So degrowth argues, if you want a good book on degrowth, Jason Hickel from LSE has just published a book which is called Less is More, okay? And basically in the book you have all the arguments for degrowth, okay? Degrowth is saying that we need to reduce uh, the volume of natural resources and energy that we consume in a fair and just way at the international level and within countries. So the idea is to combine a reduction in the material, material footprint with a reduction in social inequality. It's not always clear that degrowth is about that. There are many degrowth scholars who actually think, talk only about reduction in volumes of natural resources and not social inequality. I think that the new generation is really, if you think about Jason Hickel, Giorgio Scalise, uh, Julia Steinberger, uh, all those people, Timothée Parik in France, they are combining uh, a reflection on degrowth of material footprint with a reduction of inequality. And I think this it, it really what makes their work, I think, really strong. Um, yet, I think that degrowth is still about growth. I want to aim for something, what I, what I want to put the focus on is what we should aim for and not with what we should leave, leave behind. Degrowth is still about the growth paradigm. We are still talking about, you know, is the decrease in GDP or the material footprint of GDP the solution to our problems? I want to change the scale. For me, it's, it should be about well-being transition. And this is why I'm not, it's not an A-growth paper. It's neither an A-growth nor a D-growth nor a post-growth paper. It's a well-being paper. And this is why I'm really happy to work with the Well-Being Economy Alliance because I think well-being should be the focus. And it means that it's not about taking out the components of material footprint of, the, of GDP is aiming for completely different indicators. 
which are health indicators, and connecting them with the environment. So, what I, for example, if you look at the book by Jason Hickel, there's almost nothing on how do we do it. Okay, there's a lot about what we should leave behind and the criticism of growth. Frankly, it's not that new. Okay, there's nothing really, really new, except maybe for the neo-colonial roots. And that's a nice exploration, historical exploration, of how uh, you know, growth is also um, colonialism and machism. So it's nice in the sense that it connects with all the inter intersectional studies right now. But aside, apart from that, I don't find a lot of novelty in this book, to be honest. And what I don't find, which is really, really important, is institutions and policies. What I was referring to as well-being policies. How do we, on what policy should we work to make it happen? To say it should happen is not enough. Okay, it's, it's not enough uh, by far. Okay, we need to have a conversation on institutions and policy. What are the critical institutions? My paper is about a critical institution for the European transition, which is the welfare state. How do you change the welfare state and prove that you can have a welfare state beyond growth? That's fundamental. And it's the same for public finances. As long as we don't have conversation in institutions, we don't have a conversation on transition. We have a conversation on aspiration. Aspiration is not transition. Transition is about changing institutions. And this is what I don't find in the degrowth studies. And some of them, frankly, are a bit of a caricature in the sense that uh, it's a bit of engineer work where you take uh, the full, you know, the, 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 the whole amount of energy demand and divide it by human needs and you say, oh, you see, we can cover all human needs with only 40% of the energy we are consuming. Okay, but how do we do it? Unless you answer this question, the exercise is purely, you know, sort of theoretical uh, way of transitioning, okay? So, so this is why I'm not uh, a, a part of the degrowth movement. I read all their papers, and I think they are doing really, really a good job, especially the recent papers, because they now really cross those two dimensions, which is, uh, you know, uh, material footprint and social inequality, that is not always the case. So now, yes, I mean, you know, 10 years ago, I wrote a book in French which was called Social Ecology. And it was a book that's all about crossing those two dimensions. At that time, frankly, no one talked about it in France, this question of social ecology. So I'm all for crossing those two dimensions. This is exactly what I believe. This is what I call the justice sustainability nexus. But I want to also see a work on institutions. And I don't see it right now in the literature on, on degrowth. Okay, so is it sufficient? Okay. So, my book in French is called Sortir de la Croissance, How to Exit Growth. Should it be called, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Should it be called Sortir du Capitalisme, Exiting Capitalism, rather than Exiting Growth? All right. There are a few reasons why I don't think that's a compelling argument. I'm, I, I want to say from the onset that I think the current version of dominant capitalism is um, a, frankly, is a curse on humanity. That is, it's destroying social fabric and it's destroying the biosphere. But this is the dominant form of capitalism. Capitalism with the great C, with the capital C, the capital capitalism doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. It was never the same. It's not the same on the surface of the planet. You don't, you have never had one form of capitalism. It's impossible to define capitalism with a great C, with a capital C. You have varieties of capitalism. The literature in the academic field, it's called varieties of capitalism for a reason. Capitalism was never the same through time. The French capitalism is not the same today as it was a century ago, two centuries ago, three centuries ago, or even when Brodel says that really, it really began in the 13th century. And capitalism in France is not the same today as it is in, in India, as it is in Finland. I don't have a fundamental argument against capitalism in Finland because it's completely different than capitalism elsewhere because it has a huge component in it, which is the welfare state. And it completely changes the nature of capitalism. It's not true to say, oh, this is still capitalism and this is bad. No, if we have, you know, 
regulated markets with a very strong redistribution, very strong equality among citizens, free education, free health. It's not the same at all as having the capitalism of Bolsonaro or Trump or Modi. Okay? It's absolutely not the same. You can still criticize the moral and the ethical you know, motives for accumulating profit. But if this profit is domesticated in a way that completely changes the nature of accumulation, it completely changes the nature of capitalism. If all countries were behaving like Nordic, Nordic countries, we would be far better off in a many, many in, in a lot of ways, you know. And it's true for New Zealand. New Zealand is a capitalist country. The way it handled the COVID uh, crisis has nothing to do with the way France handled it. Okay? Do you know how many people died from COVID in New Zealand? And all since it began, since February 2020, how many people are dead today in New Zealand? The whole grand total? 26. How many people died in New Zealand in August, were dead in New Zealand in August 2020 from COVID? 25. That is, they lost one life in a year, and in total they lost 26 lives. That is, more than 30 the more than 300 times per capita, less than 300 times per capita what France lost. 400 times per capita what the US lost. And why? Because they approached this crisis with a completely different compass, which I think was well-being, and the priority given to health, among, you know, on top of all other considerations. And this is a capitalist country. And it completely changes the faces of countries to have leaders behave according to different values, okay? Now, I'm no, not going to be too long, but... So first of all, what is capitalism? It's difficult to answer this question. Capitalism with a great C, and how to exit it? Because, you know, if you want to exit capitalism, you first need to define it. What exactly do you want to exit from? And frankly, I don't know of any scholar around the world that has a convincing definition of capitalism with a great C and knowing exactly where, what it wants to exit from. That's the first problem. The second problem, you can be capitalist and gradually move away from economic growth, but you could also be non-capitalist and be absolutely convinced that growth is the best thing. And that's the question of China. Well, you can argue, well, all countries are capitalist. And so China, of course, is also capitalist because it's a state-owned capitalism. Yeah, but if it's a state-owned capitalism, then capitalism is just the other name for economic system. So there's no specificity of capitalism. I mean, half of all firms in China are owned by the government, and the rest completely depend on the government. Have you heard lately about Jack Ma? You know where Jack Ma is? because I haven't heard of him lately. Jack Ma is the founder, owner, CEO of the biggest, largest firm, basically, in the so-called Chinese capitalism. The moment Xi Jinping wants him out, you don't hear about him anymore. This is a capitalist country. This is a country where shareholders have the power, while the state actually completely owns everything. And what it own, they, they doesn't own, it influences. And it, when it decides it stop, it stops, you know? So China, at least, the least you can say is there is a big question mark on the fact that this is a capitalist country. And then you need to go into what, what once again, what capitalism is. That is, the different layers of capitalism. Because at the bottom of capitalism, you will find property rights. This is the first layer. It doesn't exist in China. Okay? You don't have private property rights. Okay. Uh, then, yes? I think we have the property rights of China. <laughs> That's protected by the law. Well, where is Jack Ma? Sorry? Where is Jack Ma then? I mean, it's because of his certain kind of activity. Uh, the financial banks he created have touched the bottom line of the financial law in China. So you think that Jack Ma actually owns Alibaba? Yeah. You think that he has the property rights on Alibaba? Yeah, I think so, yes. Because okay. Actually, yeah. I don't know. I don't, I, don't, I don't think so. I think that the, the Communist Party has the property rights of Alibaba. That is, no, if there is a decision of 
of the, <laughs> this is getting interesting. If there is a, a meeting, okay, of the Communist Party people, and they decide that, you know, Alibaba should be directly owned by someone in the room. No. Jack Ma cannot oppose that. Do you have any trial in China about people arguing in court against the state for their property rights? You have that? Do you have any example of a firm that has been in front of a Chinese court arguing against the state for any kind of control? Uh, what do you mean? Do you mean that Jack, Jack Ma do not own Alibaba now? He has no voting rights in Alibaba's like a boarding meeting or something? I mean that <laughs> the minute Xi Jinping decides that, Alibaba, that Jack Ma is not compliant anymore with the rules of the Communist Party, Jack Ma is gone, which is the case today. You say no, but why? Uh, I mean, this no, is. I just. W why do you say no? Uh, I mean, this is. Uh... Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I would say. I mean, I'm not the expert. I think you're the expert about China and their constitution. But um, so I would also say that you should speak. But for me, um, this is an fairly simple view on China and how the political system works. In my opinion, Xi Jinping is not the one who takes the decisions. It's a very complicated system of uh, balance checks and balances, um, which we would need to t uh, take a lot of time to get into. But um, just reproducing the story of, um, of a dictatorship that is ruled by one person is not sufficient to explain the success of China. But it's not about the success of China. What are the checks and balances in the constitution, the Chinese constitution? They have one of the largest parliaments in the world. And Just to, to get rid of this discussion, because we can have also capitalists with authoritarianism. So, so if, if, your, if, your, if your point is uh, the government system, uh, this is a different discussion. So capitalism is a social relation of production. If we go like to the basic, basic yes. definition, it, it has to do with property rights, which are at the basis of that, but you can still have capitalism with collective rights, for example. That totally changed, totally changed the, 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 uh, the landscape. So, so I think it's important to uh, be aware of this kind of different discussions. Of course, capitalism and um, the democracy, like the liberal democracy, have evolved historically um, cop coupled, let's say. But, but you can, I mean, I think it's very risky to say that, like, first to assume that the political process in China is just the will of uh, the, like the, the ruling person there, and uh, to assume to assume that necessarily capitalism um, or that a dictatorship cannot be capitalist. Because no, authoritarianist no, no, no. movements is what we are uh, experiencing in Latin America with high um, levels of material de depletion, of um, inequality and all the characteristics no, no, that the capitalist society has. The question was not this. The question is, is China capitalist? That's the question, right? Yeah, so but is it's just your counter, your counter question. So it's like no, no, but the, the, the question, the question I, I started with is, is China capitalist, right? And why it matters, because my argument, and the argument I make in the book, is that China is the most unsustainable country of the world uh, of the economic history, basically, okay? It has a, a material footprint on the biosphere which is completely unprecedented. And this is because China has conducted the largest economic growth experiment that has ever existed. That is, if you take the period from 1978 to 2018, okay, those 40 years, you have 10% growth per year. 10% growth per year on average for 40 years okay so this is the greatest experiment in economic growth of the whole world and you can argue at the end of those 40 years what is the result are people are do, are people more happy are they more free uh, is the environment in better shape and this is 
a, a very important experiment because it tells you much more than any kind of theoretical discussion. You this can is, ask also if people more educated, you can ask yes, of course. Yeah. You can ask all those questions. Yeah. Yeah. But but you need to ask because this is such a growth is it's very complex. It, it's complex. Yeah. It's it's absolutely complex. But this is a growthist country. Okay? So is being a growthist country necessarily means you are capitalist? That's my question, and my answer is no, okay? And also, you can be capitalist, okay? And if you don't believe in China, then you go back to USSR. But you can argue that the USSR was a capitalist regime. But I mean then, once again, what does it mean to be capitalist? Because then it just means that you have an economy working, and that all the shades of your economy, so there is no economy outside of capitalism that's possible. All right. Right now, no, because it's historical. Yes, I, I agree. And so the USSR had also a huge toll on the environment, okay, and had a commitment to growth without having a commitment to capitalism. All right. Uh, just yeah. quickly, it, does everyone who wants to still ask, ask on China and capitalism quickly put up their hands? Mm -hmm. Then we can quickly finish this and then move to all other questions. Maybe it's not the core of the It's not the core of the paper, that's why. Maybe, maybe we can yes. also proceed and then see after the procedure. Yeah. Is that, is that okay? Yeah. Yes. Then, then uh, other questions? I would like another question, but sort of associated. Yeah, I want to, but not okay. the core. You were the very first. That's okay, that's okay. It's not in the China context. Yeah, yeah, no, no. But the, I, I have nothing China. against talking about China. I'm, I'm happy with it. We are being recorded by the Communist Party as we talk, so don't worry about it. Is Zoom on? If Zoom is on, then this is goes directly to in the office of Xi Jinping, so that's fine. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Like this? Like this? Like this? Ah. Oh, no, it's very quickly uh, because I was thinking. Uh, thank you for the nice presentation. Uh, I have a question related to the role of innovation into economic growth. Because, as we know, like innovation is one of the main drivers of economic growth and requires like investment in the long run. And um, when we call for alternative approach, like beyond growth, as you said, there are many approaches, not only the growth or growth, but as, as you said, but if you call for the growth perspective, for example, um, will we expect a decrease of investment in terms of we don't want to promote uh, growth? And I, I still I, I don't understand yet how to address innovation, uh, this contradiction, because innovation is also important for well-being, for example, to promote infrastructure and, and kind of facilities that help and improve well-being, and how to deal with this contradiction of uh, reducing investment um, to not generate growth, and still uh, innovating to improve yeah, social life. That's a, uh, do you mind if we collect for you? Okay, all right, all right. But then I will forget about your questions, but okay. <laughs> yes, well, thank you for your presentation. It was really, really interesting. And I'm, I'm, really, I'm really interested also about the, the work of Kate Withrow, and I found it super interesting. But I was just wondering if you think it's possible to implement those kind of policy of the sustainable path in the world that we're living right now, because I remember in one interview you were speaking about the protocol de Montréal and how it was benefit and everything. I was but talking about it? <coughs> in another interview. Okay, another interview than this one? Yeah. Okay. But uh, I looked deeper on this subject and actually they just changed products because they found one that was less expensive. So it was just all, all the time about profits because yes, it was great to change the product and it, like the couche de zone was better, blah, blah, blah. But at the end it was just because they actually found something more profitable for them. So I was just <coughs> super curious if the, the idea of Get With World or your idea is possible in our world because we still think about pro uh, profits and everything. And um, yeah, that was my question. It goes back to capitalism. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you so much for the nice presentation. Uh, I just wanted <laughs> I just wanted to ask on the um, conditions that allow um, a welfare state to exist. I think in your paper it's quite clear that economic growth uh, is not the condition that allows it. But also you highlight that 
the most humanly developed countries in the world are those that were able to invest early in their welfare state. And those countries, are, uh, they also have um, a specific position in the global economy. They also have a colonialist past. Uh, they were imperialist countries at some point. Uh, they, these allowed some sort of accumulation. So I wonder what makes, uh, what, what are the conditions for a welfare state to take place? And also, how can we in implement an updated welfare state in developing countries that uh, never experienced it or that barely experienced it? Okay, I'm going to answer those three because otherwise I will completely forget. This is already very complex. First of all, UTC, if we don't think about, if we don't talk a bit about innovation, then, you know, it's not a, a, a lecture at, at, at UTC, right? Um, what is innovation? That's the big question of the 21st century. Are we just talking about a technological fix in the sense of finding, you know, a new technology that will, let's say we invent a gigantic vacuum cleaner that allows us to suck all the carbon from the atmosphere. Okay, then we are basically okay. So all the things about you know, geoengineering. By the way, the scenarios I've presented by the IPCC entail negative emissions. Okay, I said we need to do uh, SSP1, which is absolutely true. That's the core of the strategy. But keep in mind that all the net carbon emissions by 2050 entail negative emissions. Negative emission means that down the road, countries think that there will be some kind of technology to remove carbon from the atmosphere, including the most optimistic scenarios from the IPCC. So there is geoengineering in the IPCC scenarios, and that's frankly really concerning, because it means that uh, the net carbon strategies depend at least for 20, maybe 30 percent on technological fixes that, as of now, doesn't, don't exist, especially carbon, you know, CCS, carbon uh, capture and, and, and storage, all right? This is not, has, has, it has not been proven to really work at an industrial scale. So this, there is a big question mark on the kind of technological breakthrough. But I think for me, the real question is social innovation. And I think that in the history of humanity, social innovation is far more important than technological innovation. Why? Because social innovation is the kind of social relations, and if capitalism can be defined at the very core as a social relation, okay, and more specifically between the worker and the capitalist, okay, and the socialization or not or privatization of work, okay, and the dissociation between work and the, the property of work, uh, then the question of social relation is usually important in innovation. What makes an invention an innovation is social innovation. Think about the difference between vaccines and vaccination. The difference between vaccines, which is an invention, which is genius, by the way, was not invented by startup uh, somewhere, you know, uh, there with the private funding. It's 30 years of ARN messager uh, uh, studies being funded massively by public investment. Okay, so don't believe for a second the story according to which this is all startups and we need more startups, etc. This is massively funded by the public health service for the last 30 years and public research funding for the last 30 years. And ARN Messager goes a very long way actually and was found to have an application with this, okay, with those uh, uh, vaccines. But vaccines are not enough. We still need vaccination. If we have those inventions which are absolutely beautiful, and then we don't have the kind of equity that says that, you know, everything is going to get the vaccines in the world, then we will have variants, and, 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 and at, at the time, at the given moment, a variant is going to, you know, be vaccine resistant. And this is because you can have all the amount of invention, technological invention you, you want put on unequal social relations, you will still have an unequal outcome. And on the other hand, you know, uh, uh, why is the car, you know, moving away from the imaginary of youth in Paris? It's because, you know, there are other ways to move, uh, to move about and social. In so I would say that innovation, yes, but social innovation as important as technological innovation. And the idea that everything should rely on investing in techno technology innovation is dangerous because in a way it's sort of, of a diversion. It says don't change anything to our way of life. We are going to find the technological fix. 
And in the end, this is the paradigm, the green growth paradigm. The green growth paradigm is a sort of, we are waiting for the technological diversion in order not to make the changes we know are necessary to our way of life. And the low tech, you know, transition is quite simple in terms of, you know, energy sobriety, etc. It means cutting planes, it means cutting plastic, it means, uh, you know, and it can be done, frankly. What it do you mean by social innovation? Social innovation, the new ways to, for example, uh, uh, build energy community, you know. Energy vendor in Germany is not just about, you know, inventing new things, renewable energy technology is much more competitive today, but has not made huge breakthrough. It's more about decentralizing energy into, you know, being able to own energy at the household level or community level. Same with uh, wind farms, you know, in France. There's a big uh, talk in France about people are against the aeolian, you know, the, the big wind farms, etc. There are also places where actually people think this is a way to own their energy and have energy price stable. We are talking about fossil fuels, instability, price instability on the market. So, for example, decentralizing energy is all about reinventing social relations around energy rather than inventing new uh, uh, energy technology. This is what I'm, I'm, I'm saying, okay? So, especially it's true for France. So, this is my answer. Just, uh, yes. What does it say about the vaccine that they are investing for? So vaccines, the Bhutan, all right, yeah. Bhutan, which is a very small country uh, in the in the world, okay, which was a pioneer in well-being, uh, in the uh, growth happiness um, uh, indicator back in the 1970s, was able to vaccinate all its adult population in two weeks, no, in just two weeks. I mean, the investment to produce the vaccine. Yes. <coughs> yes. How to do it? Because st you still have the paradigm. Because you still need to do the investment to produce the vaccine, the research, and blah blah blah. To it, um, well, you can make investments with, with many other things, things than just money. You know, you can make investment with human investment. You know, with training, with training skills, with uh, education facilities, etc. So the education system today in France is not all about the money. It's not all about you know amounts of money. Okay. So. The idea of investment is, is uh, the idea of investing in human development can mean many, many different things, especially uh, in all the countries. It can mean investing in equality rather than, you know, who has access to education, for, for instance. Okay. And you can see huge, just with fairness policy, you can have huge differences in terms of the outcome, for example, in terms of investment, research and development, etc. So this is what I mean. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so the, uh, that's, that's the yeah, the other question was, yeah, so what about the ozone layer and the Montreal Protocol? The question is not so much the question of profit, it's the question of alternatives. Are there suitable alternatives to the product we want to eliminate in the supply uh, chain, all right? HFC, there was an alternative. And by the way, the alternative also has problem, all right? So if you switch to CFC, you will also have problems in terms of, for example, greenhouse gases. The truth of the matter is the protocol Montreal did more for climate change than the Kyoto Protocol. So it was a huge success, not just for the ozone layer, but also for actually the greenhouse gas uh, emissions, okay, the greenhouse gas volumes. So the question is, how prevalent is, was HFC in the supply uh, chain and of course carbon is much more prevalent. 80% today of the uh, global mix in energy is fossil fuels. So getting rid of carbon is much more difficult than getting rid of. But it means just that if you have my, my point, and it's still my point today, is that if you have uh, good institutions and good provisions in the treaties and we can really study what was good in the Montreal Protocol that made it successful, especially in terms of you know the different uh, ways of compensating developing countries from developed countries, the cooperation, revising targets, etc. We can learn a lot from what was done with the ozone layer uh, success, which is still a big success, even though the hole has uh, widened a bit uh, as of late. That was my point. So it's not, not, not just about profit, it's, it's about alternatives. Yes? And the final question, please uh, tell me again. I, you, I, said, I, I said I would, rem I would forget. Adapted welfare states for the global south. Okay, yeah, so what countries uh, can really adopt the welfare state? You're right about the fact that colonialism played a role in uh, capital accumulation in uh, developed countries. 
and uh, that was also part of what made them uh, able to invest in their welfare state. So there is all this, the question of reparation, which, by the way, can be addressed in COP26. If we have a serious conversation on climate justice, we can go back to historical responsibility in greenhouse gas emissions and have a real serious conversation about those reparations in terms of an ecological debt, which can, which can address part, at least, of uh, this colonial history. Uh, there are there's widely different experiments in terms of developing countries in terms of the welfare state. Some countries which are poor, which are, don't have a lot of capacities, etc., have been able to develop forms of social protection. Rwanda and Vietnam, for example. Very different experience than from what has happened in Brazil, where basically the welfare state was undone. While it was built by Lula, it has been in part uh, undone by Bolsonaro. So you have periods of regression. You can be a poor country and find ways to mutualize social risk, even if you are developing. You know. So I think, and this is why at the UN level and at the WHO, you have a conversation on universal welfare state. People are aware that you know, uh, it, it can be costly, but it's actually, it brings a tons of savings to mutualize social risk. To have an insurance in front of a risk is the best economic calculation you can make, basically. And whether you are poor or rich. And the poorest you are, actually, the more you will gain from having an insurance. Right? Because if you are poor, you will be completely left alone with the market mechanisms if you don't have an insurance. And pooling social risk is also the best economic calculation that you can make. So this is why I say, contrary to many of my colleagues, that the welfare state is the most intelligent invention in the history of humanity. And it's true for economic efficiency, social justice, and democracy. And this is why my point of entry in those debates is not capitalism. It's really, really the welfare state. Okay? And I'm happy we're having this conversation because I see more and more young people wanting to end capitalism. And frankly, I think it's good. And I think you should be against capitalism. Right? My, my, my argument is not that capitalism is great and as an economist, I strongly encourage you to be you know, a capitalist because this is the best thing that has happened for humanity. I'm saying the welfare state completely changed capitalism in the 20th century. And this is a reality we cannot ignore. And I'm saying it could change it even more if it integrates environmental risks. This is the, the heart of my argument, basically. Uh, what? Uh, yeah, wait, maybe yes. some... 10, 15 minutes or more, so... Okay. So ask, uh, uh, everyone quickly put their hands up if you want to ask. <laughs> okay. So we'll quickly do the questions. Can we open up just a window a bit, for just for five minutes, so that we, the air is being a bit... Uh... Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for your insightful presentation. Uh, I think all of these talks that we are having right now is really relevant. For me, the question concerns, concerns more about policies. And when we are talking, because you made this really evident point, which is inequality being the fulcrum uh, between the nexus for the social and uh, ecological transition, right? So I think that when we are talking about inequality, it's not something which could be only seen from the perspective of income inequality or capital accumulation, because we have intersectionalities between class, gender, religion. And I think these three things are something which is which are like more complicated in terms of measurement. And because you also made this point of we need something and we are aiming for well-being transition. So how do you think that these intersectionalities in terms of inequalities can be embedded into that system where we can actually measure them or we can actually use them for the policy implications? Because that is where the things get more complicated and where we have the democracy challenge to come into play. Okay, so I will answer this right away. Uh, think about carbon taxation. There are many people who believe that one of the solutions is not the only solution, but that one very important solution to cutting our emissions is to price carbon at the social cost of carbon, which is huge, okay, which is not at 45 or 50 euros, which is the price of the ton of carbon today on carbon markets, it's more like 200, 300 euros per ton, and that we need to make this price visible everywhere. How do you do a carbon tax without taking into account social inequality? Well, if you do that, you will increase inequality, 
and chances are you will not even be able to Im implement your carbon taxation. This is what happened with the Gilets jaunes in France. That is, the Macron government said there was a carbon tax. It was at 44 euros. It says, let's raise it to 44, from 44 to 55 euros, and not tell anyone that we are raising it and not give any kind of social compensation. People found out. They were mad about it. There was a revolt. The Arc de Triomphe, the poor Arc de Triomphe, was broken, at least some statues within it. This is why we have hidden it now, because now no one can, will be able to see it anymore. And so the Gilets jaunes won't find it. This is why it has been wrapped. Uh, and so, and so uh, the question is, can you do carbon taxation in a fair way? And the answer is yes. I've written a paper alongside with many other colleagues who have worked also on other ways to make it just, with two criteria. The first one is income bracket, and the other one is location, where you live. With those two simple criteria, you can have carbon taxation, which is efficient ecologically in France, and redistribute money in the pockets of 51% of the population. That is, in our model, we have a majority of the French gaining from redistribution, rebates coming after they have paid the carbon taxation based on their income and their location. First example, how do you do a just, a just transition policy at the domestic level? It's absolutely feasible in France, and not only our paper, but you have five different papers. I, will, I can uh, send a reference to David, and you will have the, the papers, all right, and see how you can do fair carbon taxation in France, which is both ecologically efficient and socially fair, all right? That's the first step. Second step at the global level. Once again, we can have a conversation. The UN just put out a report like yesterday saying uh, we are heading to a disaster, 2.7 uh, degrees warming at the end of the 21st century if everyone stays at their commitment uh, at COP26 in Glasgow, right? So COP26 in Glasgow is supposed to be the make or break summit. It's never good when you have that much pressure on a summit. Generally, it under delivers. It's uh, all, the same, all, the, all, the, all the time the same thing too much pressure, too high expectation, and then in the end, you don't have an agreement. The truth is, climate negotiation have progressed very little, okay? What I, I've heard from people you know, that are involved is that very little progress has been made because of the confusion, political confusion with the US administration, the change of government, etc., the growing tension between China and the US, etc. And so, the question is, what do we do at COP26, okay? My proposal is, let's have a conversation on climate justice. The only thing that should be done at COP26 is to know how the carbon budget, the remaining carbon budget, which is 900 gigaton of CO2, should be allocated up until 2050. We know exactly how much there is left so that we don't cross the 1.5 degrees threshold. It depends on hypotheses, but if you read the IPCC report, basically, if you want to stay within the bracket of the Article 2 of the Paris Agreement, 1.5 to 2 degrees Celsius of warming, okay, you have something like 900 gigaton of CO2 to be emitted until 2050. The only que question that matters is who has the right to emit those? On what basis? And this is climate justice. As long as we don't have this conversation on the justice criteria to use this remaining carbon budget, which is, of course, based on historical emissions, level of development, etc., etc., we will not make progress. So this is another way, practical way, into which, you know, and I've written a small paper on what kind of criteria can be used and what are the results in terms of carbon budget. I will also send the reference to, to David, so you will have a thousand pages to read after this. Uh, uh, but this is a practical illustration of, you know, these are the criteria, they are fairly simple and understandable criteria, and this is the result in terms of remaining carbon budget. So let's do it, okay? So these are practical ways, you know, to, to combine the question of inequality with the question of sustainability and, you know, have practical <coughs> results. Yes? Um, hello, thank you for your talk. Um, I'm going to tell a story, as you said, that is yes. important. <laughs> because I studied well-being in my bachelor thesis and in my past from the Spanish bubble, from Latin America, the theories of Buen Vivir and Buen Vivir. also for, from Ecuador, which is kind of different, uh, the approach, at least the theoretical approach. So I started looking at all these new measures. This was like six years ago. So all these new measures of happy index, planet, index, uh, IDT, a lot of things. 
And I just uh, conclude I have this relationship with love-hate with indicators because I conclude that all the measures that I was finding, it was just uh, made by centers, European places, or USA, Gallup, this kind of thing. So I thought that, okay, in Latin America we need another measure because we consider well-being as a different thing, like each society. So I tried to do this very deep research on Latin America and I got to the conclusion that it's mainly, for me at least, impossible to have one measure of well-being comparable international or universal because well-being is, as you said, like a very complex, dynamic, pluralist approach. How many objectives or subjective indicators do you put on it? How the society feel it's the well-being or what is well-being? Like, that's like the important question. So I like when you say maybe it's time to go beyond indicators and stop like this fighting of okay, this indicator is better or we should like compare these kind of things. So my question would be um, from my economic policy design, how can we do like a economic policies universal if not uh, to like because if not we are going to to say that well being is just this. So my question is I think that this economic policy should be only local. So I should go to Argentina and convince the president that we need like a department of well-being and then do like economic policies regarding to the, what well-being in Argentina is, which is different from here or different from. But then which is going to be like the indicator that we can compare across countries or do we need this? Do we need another fancy GDP? Maybe life, life expectancy could be, you said. But do we really need this measure for comparing countries and say which is better than another one? No. Uh, something about the question? Uh, okay, so, uh, no, I, I, I'm not in the business of indicator uh, to be in the business of country ranking. I don't care about who's the best, who's the worst, I don't care. Except that for some individual countries, some indicator will shed light on very serious, you know, problems. As I said, the HDI for the US, it's really, I mean, you see the, cri the healthcare crisis in the US just at looking at the difference between HDI aggregate and you know, health component of HDI at the UN level. But yes, you are completely right. We should not have it for ranking. This is to improve the life of people, not to pit the people against one another. So we don't care about comparing who's the best. We need to have the better life for the most people. That's what really the syndicates are about. You're right that they should be local, yes. They should also be national and also be European because it's at the national level that the growth imperative is so strong. If you talk with cities in France, they will not necessarily talk to you about GDP and growth. They will talk to you about more you know, local measures of attractiveness, uh, how to attract capital, etc. GDP and growth is very influential, but at the national level. So it's also very important to think about, and the question you raise is, should we aim for an anti-GDP? That is, another unidimensional indicator, and the answer is no. GDP should be overcome on substance and on form. GDP is a twofold mistake. It's a mistake on what it says about human life, which is that what matters is monetary transactions and things that have a price on markets, because this is only a thing that counts. It reduces human life and human experience to things that are traded on markets that have a monetary price. But it's also the idea that you can sum up everything with one indicator. And this is why I have a dashboard. My full health uh, dashboard is a dashboard. Life expectancy plays a key role because it's good to have an indicated as sort of, you know, the headline indicator. But at the same time, it's also very important to have the others. And you don't, but you also don't need 100 indicators because 17 indicators by the SDG, you have 150, you know, sub indicators in the SDGs. So 17 is already way too much. And you can have, you know, six, seven indicators in a dashboard that makes sense, that say something about the world that you want to see and the world that you think matters, and it's okay. But yes, you're right. GDP should also be understood as a mistake for the idea that you can sum everything in uh, human life into one measure. It's, it's, it's wrong. You cannot. All right. Just to end this and to go back to capitalism. <laughs> do you, are you aware of this system? Okay. So um, if we say we have 10 years to change the world, or nine years and a half, it's not that long. I would be very happy if someone had a plan to exit capitalism in the next 10 years. I think this is going to be, frankly, a bit short. And we should aim 
for practical goals. That is, we should build on existing institutions and turn them into revolutionary institutions. This is why I insist on the welfare state. And this is why I insist on growth. I am aware and I share your concern about capitalism. I think to build a coalition against capitalism in the richest countries on the planet and the countries that are not that rich today is going to take a very long time. And I think that capitalism completely redefined by abandoning the commitment to economic growth, it's not the same economic system, and giving the central stage to a welfare state that's committed to a social ecological transition, it's also the same, not the same economic regime, okay? So think also about, you know, do we have practical means and the coalition to actually make progress on this? Okay, I know this is maybe disappointing to say we are going to expand the welfare state and we're going to abandon economic growth when you dream about revolution, but this is actually a revolution. It would be a revolution, believe me. Okay, thank you very much.